Hello and welcome. This is Taste and See on SSC Live TV. I'm Ken Jobst and I'm along with you today on our journey down faith and food. And today I want you to get comfortable. Sit back, put your feet up because today we're talking about comfort food. Oh wow, I know it's a big industry, comfort food, and it carries such emotional resonance. What kind of foods make you comfortable? What, what food tells you, I'm at home, I'm where I belong, it doesn't take a whole lot of work to make it, it's satisfying, it's flavorful. Well, you know what? For me, all of the criteria of comfort food are satisfied with pimento cheese spread. Oh, there I said it, pimento cheese. When I, was, when I was a little, little kid, my mom made pimento cheese spread in the kitchen, right? And this is before you could go to the store and buy shredded cheese in a bag. She would go to the store, buy the cheese, the cheese is in a lump. We had one of those old-fashioned grater deals, you know? And my job, that's it, you got it. My job was to sit at the kitchen table with a bowl and this block of cheese and grate the cheese so it would be, you know, ready to go to make the pimento cheese spread. Now, you had to know my mom. Pimento cheese spread called for mayonnaise. And she, of course, was not one to uh, let it go with that, but she would make her own mayonnaise to put on the pimento cheese spread because it had to be just right. Well, you know what? We're not going to be making the mayonnaise. We're going to be using regular old store-bought mayonnaise because for me and my schedule, that's comfort. If I can save a little bit of time from having to make my own mayonnaise. Now I know there's, there's going to be special occasions. There's going to be times when family comes over and yeah, I can whip together some mayonnaise really quickly for that. But for comfort food, for food that sets your soul at ease, there's nothing like a pimento cheese sandwich. Now, of course, now, I, okay, there are some among us who would say that, you know what you got to do with that pimento cheese is you've got to, you got to grill that sandwich. You've got to make that a grilled pimento cheese. And to all the, the, the viewers who are, are raising their hands to grilled pimento cheese, I say, God bless you. Absolutely. I love a grilled pimento cheese sandwich. But there's something more comforting. Okay, I'm going to tell you more about me than you might want to know. If I just make the pimento cheese like this, I don't have to clean out the pan, right? So, so I'm just saying, that's a vote for the just straight ahead pimento cheese sandwich. Comfort food. Now, our scripture passage is a passage that comes from a longer, longer story about King David and what happened when David's son, Absalom, tried to stage a palace coup and kick out David and assert himself as the king over Israel. Now, as you may well know, you probably know how that story worked out, but there's, there's some, some details that I'd like for us to linger upon. Um, from 2 Samuel chapter 17, in verses 27 through 29, we're introduced to some, uh, actually to three people, but I'm going to lift up one of them in particular. And these are three people who maintained their loyalty to David even in the face of a revolution that looked like it was going to set up Absalom as the new king. Now, when you're in a situation where there's a revolution and you're thinking that, you know what, the old order is going out, the new order looks like it's coming back up, sometimes those are, those are times that call for serious decisions. And so 
Listen to this. This this is taking place. This passage in 2 Samuel 17 is taking place after Absalom has made his move to oust his father David and become the new king over Israel. Now, David has been pushed out of Jerusalem. He's been pushed out of town. And so David is an exile king on the run. From verse 27, Now it happened, when David had come to Mahanam, that Shobi, son of Nahash from Rabbah, of the people of Ammon, Makir, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar, and Barzillai, the Gileadite, from Rogelim, brought beds and basins, earthen vessels, and wheat, barley, and flour, parched grain and beans, lentils and parched seeds, honey and curds, sheep and cheese of the herd. For David and the people who were with him to eat. For they said, the people are hungry and weary and thirsty in this wilderness. So that's the little scripture passage that I would like to use as our springboard today as we're talking about comfort food. And the issue that we have here with David in this episode with the failed coup attempt of Absalom, the issue is loyalty. Who's going to stick with you when the chips are down? Or who are you going to stick with when the going might be getting tough? David, as I said, had to get up off his throne, get out of the palace, and escape Jerusalem. Because his son Absalom was asserting himself to be the new leader over Israel. At the point of of which this scripture is taken, Absalom had the momentum. He had his father David on the run. The palace coup looked like it was going to be a done deal. Now I want you to put yourself in David's shoes for just a moment. This had to be David's lowest point in his life. Why? Well, because he's a refugee king. He's a king that has been ousted from his own palace, from his own throne, from his own people. And who's the one that did the ousting? It's his own son, Absalom, whose very name means, my father is peace. Absalom. My father is peace. But you know what? I just ran him out of town because I want to be the king instead of him. So, you know what? What we're going to find out, even though Absalom committed some treachery and some treason to try to be able to usurp the throne and the authority of kingship from David, watch this. The throne didn't belong to Absalom. The throne didn't belong to David. The throne belongs to God. And it's God's prerogative of, you know, who's going to be sitting upon that throne. Because you know as well as I do, what God has for me, it's for me. What God has for you, it's for you. Now, in this episode, once again, we've got David. He's run for the hills. And he's got three people who are standing by him. But watch, you've got a guy who's from, uh, who's an Ammonite. He's not an Israelite. He's from one of the neighboring countries standing with him. Got a guy from Lodabar. As pastor has told us before, Lodabar means no pasture. So he's got a foreigner with him. He's got a poor guy with him. And then he's got this guy, Barzillai the Gileadite. Now, Barzillai the Gileadite, he's the only one from back home. Barzillai the Gileadite is the only one that has some resources to lend to David. I said lend, but I meant give to David. 
And here's the deal. As David was leaving Jerusalem, as David was headed for the hills, he encountered a guy named Shimei. And Shimei, recognizing that David was being ousted in a palace coup, literally picked up rocks and threw them at David and cursed him and said, oh, you're, you're, the, you're all my problems. All my problems come from you. And so Shimei cursed David. And David still got bodyguards. And the bodyguards are saying, hey, you, you want us to go over there and lift his head off his neck for him? You know, we can do that if you tell us to. David said, no, no, no. You know, he's got it in his heart. Let him, let him get it out. That's fine. Maybe the Lord told him to go curse me, is what David said. Now, watch. Now, we've got David in the wilderness. But some folk have come to encourage and support him. And the first among them is a guy named Barzillai. I want to tell you about Barzillai. Barzillai was wealthy. Barzillai had it like that. And Barzillai comes with supplies because supplies are as necessary to an army as warriors are. So Barzillai took significant risk. He put his, he stuck his neck out for David to, just to be able to support David. Now, had the next administration been successful? Had, you know, Absalom firmly entrenched himself as the king? Barzillai would have been in some deep, hot water. But watch. Barzillai's heart's concern was for David's welfare. David is a refugee. He's on the run. Barzillai says, you know what, David? You're going to need some place to lay down your head. So Barzillai brought beds. Barzillai said, you know what? You're out here in the dust and the dirt and the wind and the grit and the, the, the sand and everything. You're going to need to be able to take a shower or something. And so he brought basins so they could bathe. He brought earthen vessels so they could store things, right? That the, the, the Tupperware of King David's time. He brought staple foods, wheat and barley and flour. He brought beans and lentils, stuff that you could survive on, live on for a good while. In addition to the staples, he brought rich foods, honey and curds. And beyond all of that, Watch this. He's looking out for David. It's good when somebody's loyal, right? Lo loyalty means something. Barzillai actually brought sheep. Sheep. Walking around sheep. What? Why are you bringing the sheep, Barzillai? Well, you know what? David might get cold out here. And so I brought a sheep or two or a dozen sheep because you might need to shear the wool and knit you a blanket or a sweater or something because you don't know how long you're going to be out here. It could be cold by the time, you know, things change. And, and finally, Barzillai brought cheese for David, a little protein. And he brought it not only for David, but he brought it for David's entourage. He brought it for David's people as well. Why did he do it? As I said, he did it out of loyalty, out of a loyal heart to King David, out of perception, understanding that, you know what, God put David on the throne. It's only God that's going to take David off the throne. It's not going to be political intrigue. It's not going to be treachery. God put him on. Only God's going to take him off. And, and then finally, Barzillai says that he did all of this because the people were hungry and weary and thirsty in the wilderness. The wilderness. Look around you. You may know somebody that's in the wilderness right now. Or maybe you're in the wilderness right now. How do you know if it's wilderness? Wilderness is where wild stuff happens. What's wild stuff? Stuff that you never imagined is, is taking place. So, here we have Barzillai. And Barzillai is the loyal supplier of comfort for David. Where's David going to lay his head? Barzillai's got that worked out. What's David going to eat? Barzillai's got that worked out. What if, what if David gets thirsty? 
got you covered from Barzillai. What happens if David gets a little shiver out there in the night air? Barzillai's got that covered as well because he's there to support the anointed of the Lord. So, long story short, right? Absalom's rebellion is put down and Absalom is killed. And then David mourns for Absalom. And in one of the most heart-wrenching passages in the entire Old Testament, the news comes back to David that his son has been killed and that that's good news and bad news, isn't it? It's good news because then David is restored to the throne, but it's bad news because it's David's son. And David's heart is torn apart because these, these conflicting emotions get, you know, to the point of just overwhelming him. And he says, Oh, my son, my son, Absalom, would to God that I had died in your place. Oh, my son, oh, my son, Absalom. It's the most heart-wrenching, terribly emotionally laden passage in the Old Testament. But then, what happens? On his way back to Jerusalem, Barzillai appears again. And watch. From 2 Samuel 19, Barzillai the Gileadite came down from Rogelim, went across the Jordan with the king. That is, the, the, the king is getting the band back together. He's, he's coming, he's been banished out of the land and now he's coming back. And Barzillai comes to escort him across the Jordan. Now, Barzillai was a very aged man. He was 80 years old. And he had provided the king with supplies while he stayed in Mahanam, for he was a very rich man. Verse 33 of 2 Samuel 19 says, And the king said to Barzillai, Come across with me and I'll provide for you while you're with me in Jerusalem. Right? It's an invitation to be at the king's table. It's an invitation to enjoy all of the benefits of being tight with the king. But Barzillai said to the king, How long do I have to live that I should go up with the king to Jerusalem? I'm today 80 years old. Can I discern between good and bad? Can your servant taste what I eat or what I drink? Can I hear any longer the voices of the singing men and the singing women? Why then would your servant be a further burden to the Lord the king, my Lord the king? Your servant will go a little way across the Jordan with the king. And why should the king repay me with such a reward? Please, let your servant, Barzillai is talking about himself, let your servant turn back again, that I might die in my own city, near the grave of my father and mother. Right? So what's that tell us? It tells us Barzillai was not in this thing with divided loyalties. Barzillai was not in this thing looking to get something out of it. That's called transactionalism. That, that, that's like quid pro quo. I'll do this for you if at a later date you do that for me. It's saying Barzillai's heart was in the right place when he went to provide comfort for David. And there's blessing in that. So that, that's the story of Barzillai. And you know what? One of the things that Barzillai brought along was uh, cheese. We've got a little cheese right here. This is going to be the cheese for our pimento cheese spread that we're getting ready to make. And you know what? One of the, one of the things that happened to me in the last week or so, I tried a shortcut. And you know, shortcuts don't always work. So I went to a store and I bought pre-prepared pimento cheese spread even though I know and you know it's easy to make. So, I got it home, I took off the lid, I removed all the foil from it, and you know what? It just didn't taste right. And so, it convicted me that I gotta get right back out there and just make some more pimento cheese spread. So, I've got my pimentos, and yes indeed, watch this. Oh yeah, you're watching very closely. This is not exactly a pimento. This is a roasted red pepper. 
Now, there's a difference. It's a subtle difference in flavor. But I've grown pimentos and I've grown, you know, uh, red sweet peppers. The pimentos do have a distinctive flavor, but the roasted red peppers are going to give you 99% of the flavor of a genuine pimento. And as I come along, I'm just like cutting this little pimento, excuse me, roasted red pepper, cutting it into strips. <laughs> and we've got, there we go, we've got several strips right there. Now, I cut them a lot long ways. I'm going to cut them once across the middle, right? And so that goes into our mixing bowl, which is here. Good, we're making progress. I want to do that one more time because I'm looking at about one cup of cheese, shredded cheese. By the way, the cheese is shredded, mild cheddar. Shredded, mild cheddar cheese. By the way, did you know that cheddar, cheddar used to be a verb? Did you know that? That cheddar used to be a verb, uh, it, as in to cheddar something. And to cheddar some food meant that you had preserved it with salt. And so if you're on a sodium restricted diet, uh, cheddar cheese might not be your first choice because its very name says it's heavy on the salt. So there's a couple of those red peppers. Now I'm going to add to that some of my shredded mild cheddar cheese. Colby cheese works well. I, I am not yet to the point where I have tried mozzarella. I don't think mozzarella would work in this particular recipe. And I'm not at the point where I've ever tried, uh, although I've been encouraged many times, I've never tried pepper jack cheese. But you know what? I think that would just be awesome. So I've got about a cup right there. And right here, I'm going to add two teaspoons, heaping teaspoons, admittedly, they're heaping teaspoons, of mayonnaise, genuine mayonnaise. And a shout out to my uh, daughter-in-law, Natalie, who came over to the house one day with a jar of mayonnaise and a spoon and had the top off the jar of mayonnaise and had the spoon in the mayonnaise and got a big spoonful, put it in her mouth and ate it. And I looked at her and she looked back at me and she took that very same spoon and put it right back into the mayonnaise jar, got another big load on that spoon and took it out and put it in her mouth and ate it. And that time she laughed and giggled. I thought something's going on here. I don't know anybody in my life that could eat a big heaping teaspoon of mayonnaise and then turn right around and eat another heaping teaspoon of mayonnaise. And she said, do you want some? I said, no, I don't want some. I don't eat mayonnaise by the teaspoonful. Well, she got in that mayonnaise jar a third time. Three times this has happened. She's in that mayonnaise jar. And lo and behold, she brings the spoon out one more time and takes another bite, full spoon of mayonnaise. At this, at this I, I can just stand no more. I cannot even handle it. And so she said, I think you should try it. So I took a little tiny spoon and just a little tiniest, tiniest little tip of the spoon put in the mayonnaise jar, came out and tasted it It was vanilla pudding that Natalie had put in the mayonnaise jar to set me up. I look at the calendar. It's the first day of April. How does this happen? All right. I've, I've, I've got my, my mayonnaise. I've gone a little bit high on the mayonnaise right over here. I've got uh, my one cup of shredded 
mild Colby cheese. I'm going to now, I've stirred this up real good. And you know what? There's nothing like a couple of slices of bread. I'm gonna put one of my little slices of bread over here. Now I'm making the sandwich right here. Oh yes, this, oh mercy, right? Okay, there is the first of what's going to be two spoonfuls of our pimento cheese spread. And it's going right on a large wheat bread slice and to which I have its mate. It's very important to be sure you get the mate of the slice of bread that you're working with. And you get them absolutely oriented just right. And so there we have the sandwich. And you know what? I'm a, I'm a believer. I'm a diagonalist. I believe that sandwiches should be sliced on the diagonal. So here we go. Slicing on the diagonal, that gives us, along with a nice little garnish of pickles right here on the side, and you know those are the hot pepper pickles that I know and love, we've got comfort food. Comfort food for you and the family and anybody else that comes over. You can eat it on wheat bread, you can eat it on rye or white bread, you can eat it on crackers, however you like. You know what, even just get in the refrigerator and feel free to dive in yourself. So, for Taste and See, this is Ken Jobst. We've got the nice little recipe included for you for the pimento cheese spread. Until next time, it has been a delight to be with you. God bless you. Tune in again. Let somebody else know about Taste and See on SSC Live TV. We'll see you next time. Take care. This is Ken Jobst. Bye-bye.